Good evening, everyone. I, uh, if there are questions based upon what we talked about or uh, things that have come to your mind. Uh, no, Evelyn, no, no, back up. Evelyn, back up. I'm just teasing her, Sage. You got a ton of questions. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't resist. What is it, Evelyn? Um, I'll wait and see if someone else got something, if that's okay. Nope. Okay. Thank you. You're the boss. Okay. Now, after we talked on Sunday, yesterday, we discussed um, Exodus 3 with Moses and everything. And I was curious, and, and, and I was thinking about, well, what does the bush represent spiritually? So I went, and I got that the bush means God's miraculous energy, sacred light, illumination, the burning heart of purity, love, and clarity. So I called Ms. B.J. Simons and talked to her about it last night, and she put it in um, in a perspective on what the bush meant as well. So um, I just felt that I wanted to share that with everybody. And... Um, the removal of the sandals, it meant reverence, humility, and respect. She also put that in perspective for me as well. Um, and I would like to share that with everybody, if Barbara don't mind telling everybody what she told me last night. Let's hear it. Ms. Barbara? Are you on mute, Ms. Barbara? She may not be on ever. Okay. And then when she get on, and then I was reading um, Exodus 3, um, verses 7 through 8, and where it said that um, God said, I've taken a good look, I've taken a, a good long look at the affliction of my people, or where I, I put myself, my name in there, like it would say, um, I've taken a good long look at the affliction of Evelyn, Evelyn in a cramped space. And then it says, I've heard Evelyn cries for deliverance from the slave masters, which I think meant that, that those um, thoughts that enslave you, I just made it more personal, and I just wanted others to who are going through or uh, who are going through a situation or whatever to just put themselves in that place. And to me, I, it just felt more personal to me. You know why? Why? Because affliction speaks to being uh, depression, being in misery, having, been, having a troubled heart, or being in poverty. So all the things that we have been experiencing and been witnessing that's what the afflictions were. So that's why I felt so personal. And then I wonder why he said, I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's because of the covenant that he um, that he had given. Yeah, he re that's the covenant that he had remembered with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was, he was reminding him. Yes. But Barbara really helped me last night to understand the burning bush because I know it, it had a significance, and that really helped me to understand. Let me ask a question then, baby. Okay. I'm waiting for her. Um, let me see if anyone else would speak to that, the burning bush and the sandals. Don't go silent on me, please. Does the sandals represent a, a readiness? Well, if he had to take them off, what does that mean? Taking them off because you are standing on holy ground. Right. Um, could it mean that, well, it means in part, 
that um, he tells to, to pause in the midst of um, the journey that he's traveling and take notice because the awareness that he is receiving is set apart from any other that he's ever received before. And it was the bush burning but not being consumed that got his attention. So it it speaks to whatever it takes for the creator to get your attention. Sometimes there are dire things that happen in our lives that causes the creator to get our attention. And then there are times when uh, the things that happen in our lives are shocking. But how whatever it takes to get our attention, it happens. And whether we pay it attention or not, or whether we, quote, unquote, remove our sandals and, and uh, pause our journey, it's dependent upon us. Moses stopped, and he took the time to explore what he was being made aware of. Does that help? Is there anyone else who would like to add to that or comment on it? That helped me. Okay. No one else? Pastor, she also said that's what they did in the Middle East before they would enter into their uh, home, so to speak. Well, this is, um, I have been in homes of people who are from the East, be it um, India, Pakistan, or uh, Northern Africa in particular, anywhere in Northern Africa. I remove my shoes because that is respect for their beliefs. So that still happens to this day. However, there are some people, especially Christians, who won't do that, won't remove their shoes because, as we all know, they only respect what they believe and not what other people believe. So... Anyone else who just came on who wants to, would like to speak to um, the understanding of taking off the sandals and the burning bush? Okay, Barbara, were you one of those people who came on? The reason I raised the question is because uh, there may be people who are waiting to get on. So um, in the event that you would like to speak to it or if Barbara comes on, we'll uh, ask her again. Okay, Evelyn? Yes, sir. And you know what, though, Pastor? I see myself in in all of it, all of this. I mean, it is like... I don't know. It just this really resonated with me after we got off the phone and everything. Let me ask this then. You guys who were on the phone, did it resonate that deeply with you? If so, please let me hear it. It simply takes a yes or a no. Yes. Thank you, Barry. Yes. Yes. Anyone else? Okay. Yes. Yes, it most certainly did. Thank you. Um, I want to, um, in addition to that, speak to what happened between Moses and the Creator in terms of um, their conversation, what took place with their conversation. Um, When Moses was told that he would put words, the 
creator would put words in his mouth, he wouldn't have to worry about what to say. I see that also as a par- another parallel, rather, to um, what happened with Jesus and what Jesus taught when uh, he was in human form. And that is, take no thought for what you will say when you're called before the judges, for the Father will um, give you the words to speak. That should definitely resonate, and the reason I say that is because there are so many times when we've had those experiences, especially when someone is grieving, of not knowing what to say until we were in their presence, or someone who was hurt as a result of someone else's negligence or insensitivity. And we were the comforter and did not know what to say. But I'll share with you that when you're with people who are going through things, the loudest thing that you can say is simply your presence. There are times when there are no words to be uttered, but there is empathy to be expressed, and it doesn't have to be verbalized. It can simply be expressed by your presence, by an embrace, by a glance, a look. That's why people sometimes squeeze the hand as opposed to saying anything when somebody's going through something. That is energy speaking. That is the unicity of our being speaking. That is a recognition that we are indeed our brother's keeper. That is an acknowledgement that all of us are the same energy. It's just arranged in different ways. And what I mean by being arranged in different ways, our thoughts are our thoughts are the energy that is arranged in different ways, yet it's the same energy. And the arrangement of that energy is either done by us or is done by the Creator, is done by us if we choose to do so. However, when you start the journey of truth, a search for truth rather, a search for truth and desire to be righteous, that energy then begins to be arranged by the Creator or the thoughts be arranged by the Creator. And the Creator who arranges those thoughts is our soul. And our soul is the essence of the energy with which we were created. The energy with, with which we were created is not what keeps us alive. It it, um, gives us the opportunity to interact with each other in a different way. We can interact with each other negatively or we can do it positively. The thing that keeps us alive is not that energy. The thing that keeps us alive is the energy of breath. The Shekinah is what keeps us alive. And that makes it imperative for us to have an in-depth understanding of what we are talking about when we speak to the con- 
concept, the reality of Shikana. We have, in so many ways, neglected the power, the respect that the Shikana is and deserves. We have lost our sense of reverence to the Shikana, and that is reflected in how we engage with representatives of the Shikana or symbols of the Shikana, and that is femininity, female. What we have done in a religious way is turn our backs on the efforts of Sarah, Hagar, Rebecca, Rachel, Mary, all of them, Zipporah, all of these are instances where the Creator is telling us the depth of respect that the Shekinah deserves and the power that the Shekinah has to keep us on a journey of righteousness. If you think about the names, the, the energy sources, the energies rather, that I just spoke of, all of them played a major role in God and humanity on a journey towards righteousness and showing humanity how to on that journey without faltering, even though we have faltered. The disrespect for the Shekinah is the greatest when we are assigned to the Shekinah the experiences that we have with religion based upon the music and the sound of the preaching or teaching. We talk about it in cultural terms when it really isn't so much cultural as it is different methods that are used to um, burden the Shekinah with our antics. In the African church, it's rhythm that we engage in and attribute it to the Shekinah, even though the words that come before, during, or afterwards are not words that are in line with the scriptures or with the actions of the Shekinah. Yet we do it anyway. In the Caucasian church, it's usually tears are rocking or screaming that we attribute to the Shekinah, when in reality, the Shekinah speaks in a still, small voice. When we look at what happened with um, Jacob, and Esau, is it that is it that Rebecca fooled Isaac? Or is it that Rebecca surreptitiously did the will of the Creator, meaning that the Shekinah did whatever it took in order to maintain the presence of righteousness in the earth. And 
if we look at the other the other writings that reference what the female did or what femininity did or what the Shikana did, we will see that it was the same thing. Even when the um, Rahab, when Rahab was considered a prostitute, yet protected those who were men seeking to travel this journey of righteousness. Even though she was considered a prostitute, what the scripture is actually saying is to think of it. The Shekinah does what it does because it is righteousness, and it is the source of all life in this earth. No one can live in this earth without breathing. Nothing lives in this earth without breathing. Nothing physical stays in this earth in a physical form without breathing. So, what it's actually saying is, even though you put labels and burdens on the Shekinah that it does not deserve, it does not deter it from doing its duty or taking care of its responsibility in maintaining a life source for everything that lives in this earth. And it's a constant source of reminder to us, even though we've gotten so intelligently, intelligent rather, scientifically, until we have lost any kind of connection to that. We don't look at it as it is in the scriptures. The Shekinah shows us that we are also life givers because when we exhale the Shekinah, then it gives carbon dioxide to the plants so they can live. All of these physical things that we experience are indicative of the experiences that Moses had, whether it be on Mount Horeb or whether it be in the wilderness itself or floating on a river in Egypt. All of those are sending us a message. It was the Shekinah who gave birth to that which would draw out pull out of us the things that were ad- adversarial to what we are supposed to believe. It was the Shekinah who put him in the basket. It was the Shekinah who drew from the basket. It was the Shekinah who reared him. Even though we look at that Shekinah as being the daughter of Pharaoh, it was the Shekinah doing what it is supposed to do in order to maintain life. And this is true because from the beginning, man did not become a living soul until the Shekinah was breathed into his countenance. So when we look at the way the Shekinah is treated in religion and the way femininity is treated in this earth. What we see is the power that gives life, the only power that sustains life, is really
relegated to what a place of what can I say? What word am I searching for? It is it, treated as though it's not important at all. Yet all of us benefit from it. And we can see that in the face of religion. If it were not for the femininity in, in religion, the females, there would be no church. Yet, femininity is given a back seat until it can be utilized for selfish reasons. And doing all of that, the Shekinah still maintains what it was brought into existence to maintain, and that is life itself. It matters not whether we embrace it. It's going to do what it was brought into this earth to do. And that is the reason when we look at the word wife in reference to Moses and in pretty much everywhere in the scriptures, we see Esau, which is the feminine aspect of our creator, which is the feminine aspect of Adam. When we look at masculinity, what we see is Enosh speaks to the uh, mortal man. Esau, Ish speaks to the spiritual man. But there is no word that I have found you so far anyway for a mortal woman or a mortal female. I see Ish when it's when it references the wife. I see Ish when it references the um the the, the woman when it, when his woman is Ish. I mean, it's y'all. So what am I saying? I'm saying that in this realm of the spirit, there is ish and there is isha. In the realm of this earth, there's only man, enosh. Even if you look for a woman in the scriptures and do a search for its root, it goes back to man. Why is that so? Because there is absolutely nothing physical about Esau. There's nothing physical about the Shekinah. There's nothing physical about Esau because Esau is the source of life. And it is my contention that the reason that is true is because no life comes from the womb of any woman and lives in this earth that does not live based upon the ability to breathe. That in itself is femininity. This body cannot exist without it. And the reminder of that constantly is the female. The femininity of the female is all spiritual. And there is no surprise to me after having seen that, that that is the reason, even in religion, its foundation, its line, its lifeline, is the representative, the symbol of Shekinah. 
it does not matter whether it is Catholicism, whether it is Christianity in all of its forms, Islam, Hinduism, it doesn't matter. All of them draw their life from the same source. That is the Shekinah. And this journey of Moses speaks clearly to that, as did the journey of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I do believe that when we look at the scriptures, what we will see is when when the Creator says, I am the Father of Abraham, of the God, rather, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What the Shekinah is reminding us is, I am the seed. I'm sorry, what the what Elohim is reminding us is, I'm the seed of a boom. And the seed of a boom is seen when we look at what happened when Abraham's name was changed. It says that he would be the father of many nations, but what was added to his name prior to that was the Shekinah, the spiritual. That was the spiritual aspect of his existence in this earth. Up until that point, he was aware that there was something greater than what he had been taught as a child, something much greater than the idols that he once worshipped. So what the Creator is saying is, once you are aware of the hate, that your breath that you breathe is not just oxygen and other minerals. It is life itself, and it is feminine. I am Elohim. I am the seed that reminds Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of the Shekinah, the source of life. How is that so? Abraham with the head added to his name and the seed after that is automatically um, living based upon the he that was in Abraham's name meaning that that is the reason Jacob would be a father of nations and so would Esau and so would Ishmael and the descendants of Abraham, regardless of where they were, which means that it was up to these descendants to carry into the world, the earth, the understanding of the basics of our existence in physical form. The basics of our existence in physical form was for us to become human. Simply because we walk around in a body, it does not make us human. It is our interaction with each other. It is our thoughts that determine whether we are human or whether we are animalistic. And the Creator has given us every opportunity to determine which pathway we are going to take, being animalistic in our thoughts or being human in our actions. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. 
give our thoughts are selfish and based upon greed and domination of others. The survival of the fittest is animalistic. If our thoughts are truly, truly that we are the keepers of of each other, the protectors, the fence, the hedge around each other, it is then that we become human. And when we made a decision to follow a pathway that leads us to righteousness, at that time we did not understand that the same pathway that we were seeking to lead us to righteousness is the pathway that leads us to being human. And there are those in our midst who we've grown up with who passed away, and some still in our midst are caught up in religion, and they're fighting to be human. The fight to be human when you're religious is why is it that we only wait till a holiday before we help people in need? Why can't we do this all the time? And then the animalistic response to that is we can't help everyone. We can't feed everybody. If we help someone, they need to give us an hour you. We got to make sure that we maintain the building. We got to make sure that we maintain our status. And there are those who rail against that attitude, fighting to be human. And for the most part, the ones who are engaged in fighting to be human are the females, the symbols of the Shekinah, fighting to be human and not understanding that the very one who they look to for spiritual cover, covering is the one who is fighting against them. The fight is against what's in the pulpit, in the Sunday school classroom, in the, in the, in the convention, in the association. Ecclesiastical leadership is fighting to remain animalistic in thought. While those who are following are fighting to be human and falling back from that because of having been indoctrinated with the belief that whatever the covering says, whatever the pastor says, whatever the teacher says, whatever the ecclesiastical leadership says, that is what we must respect because, after all, God called them. Called them to do what? To build buildings, to, to build monuments unto themselves, call them to do what? To engage enough people in a phony belief to the extent that they don't have to work anymore, not even working to protect the ones who they cover, not even wor- working to take care of those who in their flock. I don't understand how it can be justified that paying someone's utility bill must be guaranteed with an IOU, and they have been in that place for over a day. I don't understand how you were called to preach or call into ministry or call to teach and someone
someone dies, and simply because they are not in your congregation, they have to pay to use a building, and they pay enough to cover utilities for two or three months, simply for a few hours of usage. If that's not greed and animalistic, then what is it? It's certainly not being human. And we know it because we talk about treating each other like like we are human. We talk about that, but we don't look at the other side of it. If you tell me that I need to treat somebody as though they are a human, put myself in their place is a way of saying treat them like they are human. Walk a mile in their shoes is just like saying treat them as though they are human. When you, if you say that to me, then what am I being at that moment if I'm not being human. Walk a mile in their shoes and you would not have a problem helping them if you understood what they were going through. That's telling me not to do that is animalistic. Worse than that, as a matter of fact, because animals protect their own, animals feed their own animals, look out for their own animals or each other's keeper. So it's worse than that. So this whole concept that we see in the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, are concepts that guide us in the same direction every single time. Jesus had a wilderness experience. Moses had a wilderness experience. Abraham had his wilderness experience. It was nomadic, but it was yet a wilderness experience. Lot had his wilderness experiences. Ishmael, Jacob. Esau, wilderness experience. All the scriptures saying to us is this. Stay the course. You're going to you're going to go to dry places at times. Your burdens are going to seem to be insurmountable, too heavy to carry. They're going to be periods when you do experience depression, misery, poverty, stay the course. Because regardless of what we face, the truth still is if you seek to understand the kingdom principles and understand the nature, the essence of righteousness, everything that needed to sustain you will be made available to you. Depression, most of our depressions that we go through are connected to money, materialism. Most of our misery that we go through deals with our emotions and what we think people should be doing in relationship, who are in relationship with us. Poverty is not only the lack of money. Poverty is also spiritual. And I submit to you, regardless of financial or social status, everyone who's engaged in religion in any form 
is destitute, is living in poverty. Their spirit, their soul is hungry, crying out for deliverance from poverty. And because our Creator has heard the cries of those sincere hearts who are crying out for deliverance, we have been granted the privilege to look into the book and see far beyond the book. We have been shown the words in the book go far beyond what's printed on the page. We've been granted this because our creator, well, let me put it this way, a boom has heard the cries. Ainsoff has heard the cries of what was brought into existence. And those cries came through those who were not only in bondage, but those who were seeking to be free from bondage, to leave Egypt, to take up residence in Median with the priests with real, real friend of God, the friend of Elohim. And having done so, being guided meticulously through the minefield of mistakes and, and erroneous teaching, been guided through rough places during hard times, but yet because we are each other's keeper, protector, we're able to sustain each other to get things poured out of us in our wilderness, especially those of us who have at times secluded ourselves and put in the work to understand what's in the book. How can we deliver uh, humanity to a place of being human? Put in the work, hours upon hours, not concerning ourselves with how much it costs or what it costs, knowing that the search would not be in vain, and now having seen a glimpse of what we have been searching for, We now see that the issue is not government, it's religion. And upon our shoulders, we have heaped the whole of mankind to bring mankind to a place that we call balance, place that we call peace and harmony, when all we are saying is to bring humanity to its senses so it can experience what it feels like not only to be human, but to be treated like a human. We have ventured beyond our boundaries, 
even though it was uncomfortable, for the express purpose of saving humanity from doom. Making a promise, a declaration that if this earth and its inhabitants are to be destroyed and a new earth, a new type of man raised up in this earth realm, that was not going to happen on our watch. That has been a mantra, our determination. And I believe that we are not on the doorstep of bringing this into reality, but we have crossed the threshold in bringing it to reality. Not on our watch. We will teach. We will respond to religion in a respectful way, but more importantly, in a truthful way. It matters not what rejection comes our way. The commitment is to bring in humanity to a place of being human. And because of that determination, we have seen, we have experienced what Jesus meant when he said, I will give you a new family. And that family has become a power force, a power source in this earth for change. So when I look at what is written on the pages in reference to Abraham, Moses, and the others, I see the same objective. I see that to achieve this objective, we have to be ready to endure hardship. And we have proven that we are. Jesus said, if you believe as I believe, if you trust a wound the way I do, not only will you accomplish the teachings that I have brought to you, you will follow them, but greater things you will do. What are you saying, Jesus? What are you saying to us? What are you saying? Jesus said, if you trust a womb the way I trust a womb, you will understand everything that I have taught. You will understand that you are Elohim as he said to the scribes who challenged him in the 10th chapter of John, is it not written that I say to you, God, that you are eloquent? If you believe what I've taught you, not only will you become teachers of what I taught you, You will do greater things because you will bring to 
to an end. The divisiveness, the hatred, the manipulation that blinds us to what it really means to be human. It is impossible for us to be human without first being Elohim. It is impossible for us to talk about human as a body when human is a combination of the Shekinah and a body. A combination of who else he is in this body. When we look at the simple word Elohim, one yet many, one spirit embodied in many, the embodiment, the embracing the expression of being one yet many, of being both male and female, of being engaged in a divine experience in a physical place. That's what human is. Human is open and blinded eyes, not physically, but spiritually, and understanding the importance of the metaphor of the blinded eyes. Being human is not only healing the leper, but is also feeding the hungry. With fish and bread. Multiplying it so that all the multitude, the flock, can live without being afraid of dying for lack. We are the ones who who the mantle has been placed upon. To carry the torch that says all lack is burned away when you understand who you are and embrace it. Look at who we are. We may have a perception of lack, but it's not a reality of Yes, we are Moses, and Moses is us. We are the poor. We are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We are Aaron. We speak for each other. We speak to each other. We speak with each other. We have become one voice. And in being that 
one voice. We have accepted as a reality that divinity flows from our lips every time we part them. We don't need a written page. We don't need any more overnight research as we've done in the past. Why? Because the research that we were doing has already been searched. we just redoing it. And once we found the gateway, the books began to fall by the wayside and gather dust on the shelves. The laptops became few in our meetings. The understanding became clearer. The more we moved away from feeling that we needed to do all this in-depth research, the clearer we became. However, the research was necessary because that was the wilderness experience, and that pulling out was taking place. We pulled it from each other. I never shall forget it. One day we met, and we looked at the word adultery. And it says that only a woman could commit adultery. And Janice said, well, that's not fair. We said it's not because it's not true. And that was a bold step for us at that time. But that is the step that jailed us. That's the step that intensified our search. Even though we did not know what we were searching for, and to this day, we don't know what it looks like. But we don't have to. We know what it feels like. Are there any questions? Are there any comments? Are there any anything? Hey, Rhea. So you're saying that we are our brother's keeper no matter who it is? Absolutely. No matter who it is, no matter what they've been accused of, or no matter what they've done, no matter what they've said to us, about us, or anyone else. Yes, we are. Okay. Anyone else? You know, he said from the beginning about somebody just need to hold your hand, and then you said uh, about sometimes you just don't have to say anything. You just need to be there just to listen, and that's exactly it's just confirmation as to what happened on yesterday and on today, I was explaining that to a lady. She said, well, I don't know what to say because of, you know, the lady passing in our church. And I said, sometime it's not for you to say anything. The family member just needed to pour out, and she just needed to just be that ear just to listen. And the woman that uh, she felt so much better after I told her that because she felt like she was just, rambling, scuffling for something to say to the lady, and I said, well, you didn't have to say anything. And then the young man just holding his hand, I patted him on his back, and I said, it's going to be okay. And he just grabbed my hand, and he was just holding it, and he didn't want to turn it loose. And and I felt his pain when I was holding his hand, and just me just standing there by his side letting him know it was going to be okay because he's facing some things on tomorrow. And uh, it just being there holding his hand, he just felt like I got somebody that's there for me. You know, am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, I was just right there at a time when he, you know, when he needed somebody. 
Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Pat, this is Ron. You've, uh, you, you, you said a lot, and uh, I guess my mind was uh, going different directions listening to you. Uh, one of the things you said, though, that caught my attention was uh, the feminine energy, the Shekinah. You, you talked a lot about that. And uh, it made me think about uh, when we looked up the definition for for helpmate, uh, the surrounding to protect, to stand against, to to oppose, and I thought about that when you talked about uh, some of the the the, the women uh, that were married in with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it looked very, in some cases, very unorthodox, some of the things that took place, but we do not think to see that Rebecca really protected Isaac uh, by opposing him uh, and by keeping him from breaking the law. Uh, in, in, indeed, I think you said the Shekinah does whatever is necessary and she kept him from breaking the law by doing what was necessary because the law said there was a certain thing he had to do with the firstborn and she made sure that that stayed intact uh you 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 look at that and, and i even you you mentioned about the abuse that goes on today in the church and, and outside the church for that matter with, with feminine energy and, and I would just suppose that feminine energy is so powerful that that is one way that it protects the earth now is by lying dormant. And, and it works two ways. It is activated when man awakens and seeks to bring about balance by finding truth. And it activates or the feminine energy awakens as well and does what it does. Uh, and in the meantime, that may be what we are doing or it is what we are doing to starting that process, that awakening process. And if you look at the scriptures and, and even and, and this is just a supposition, me, me thinking out loud, maybe even that is what Eve did with Adam. Uh, it was a protecting kind of thing because the voice that spoke to Adam, uh, she kept him from doing what she ended up doing, and 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 I, and I think all of that is was necessary for the earth to be awakened uh, to, to what we're going through right now. So I mean, there there are many examples of, and even some of the things that Rachel and Leah did. Uh, I think that the power of the Shekinah is being awakened now and being unleashed. And uh, maybe that is why it seems like things are in such turmoil in the earth. As, as they, 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 they've always been at some point, but now things seem to be uh, at a fevered pitch. And uh, maybe the, the spirituality that man has been looking for is... is uh, finally upon him and, and, and we're right in the midst of it. So uh, it, it, there's a lot of things you said and, and I could say I'm just kind of thinking out loud. You just got my mind to, to run in when, you, when you were talking about that. And uh, it was something else, but I, I can't remember what it is now. But anyway, thank you. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. 
the um, the, the turmoil that we see is the deconstruction and the reconstruction of a house, the deconstruction of a house built on lies, and the construction of a house seeking truth. That's our current experience. there anyone else pastor you mentioned about uh the we'll, like we would have to we would go through dry places what would that the dry places uh, uh look, look like? like yes sir the dry places are times when we feel like giving up that we're all alone if you're in a desert place a dry place there is no water you're thirsty, and you feel like because you have been told there's no water in the desert, you're going to die there. But then the Shekinah cries out, and Elohim hears, or Yahweh hears, Ishmael, I have heard the Shekinah cry out, and water appears. Dry places when you feel like the burden is too heavy, and you walk too far, and you can't go anymore. And because the Shekinah is crying out, Elohim, Yahweh, puts you on someone's heart and they call you and they become your water in dry places because they become that fence. They become that lifter of your soul. They become the one who says to you, you are not traveling alone. I'll carry your burden with you. That's what it looks like. Does that help you? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Fred, one more question. Why did Jesus say, I only do what I see my father say, instead of, I only do what I see my father tell me to do? You understand what I'm saying? Anything he say, he only do what he see, what he, what, if, what the father say. I do understand exactly what you're saying, Charles. And I can tell you exactly what he was saying. He said, the only thing that I speak to you is what I perceive from a womb, from my father. So that's what he was saying. What I'm speaking to you tonight, well, this is not something that I intended or knew or wrote, or wrote down. I am perceiving what's needed. Everyone who teaches, must have a perception of what a wound is saying. Must see it and, and, and relate that to those who are being taught. When you are teaching, I'm receiving. And when it resonates, it's simply saying that I'm a witness that that is the truth. I don't understand all the functions of my vehicle, but I believe it will carry me where I need to go. I don't have to understand all the nuances of what's in the book, but I do know 
that they are my source of strength, even though I don't understand it. I know it's there. That is the reason the world is so wicked. It's because it's only a handful of people who think they are the ones who are the curators of the scriptures. And all they know is what's written on the page and don't know much of that. When you understand that you may cover someone, but you don't know it all, and the ones you cover, you must open their eye so that yours can be open also. And when that happens, everyone becomes each other's teacher. By your questions, by your comments, and as Ron puts it so often, by talking through it as well. That's who we are. That's who we were brought into the earth to be. And who we are. And our purpose for being in this earth will not end. I believe that the period that we are in is so critical until a great part of this plague was to separate us from each other's space and let us experience each other's energy and hear not with our ears, but with our hearts and focus without having to look at the frown on someone's face or or someone being puzzled. That gives us the opportunity to see with the eye and read from the scrolls that's written on our heart. It gives us the opportunity to process and raise questions that we never would have processed if we were in a setting where there's so much physical movement and uncontrollable energy. That has been done. That is being done. And that will continue to be done even when we come back together physically, the same lines will be open on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday as they're open right now. Never shall we be separated in different places without communication unless we choose to. Are there any comments or questions? I thank you guys for listening. Not with your ears, but with your heart. I know that you are where you are on this line because wherever you are, And whatever you are encountering and the ones around you, you are the answer to it. You are the energy source for humanity. Don't ever forget that. And if your burden gets heavy, you feel like you're going you're being dis you're getting disillusioned. Call someone. Because after all, We are our brother's keeper. Thank you, and have a great night. Wait, Reverend Richards, are we going to meet next week since that's Thanksgiving week? 
Thanksgiving is on Thursday. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. I I don't I don't feel it that we should separate not separate but miss this opportunity. Why am I saying that? I really don't know. What I do know is it's imperative that we make this connection. We are at a critical place, and I cannot even explain what I mean by that. But I know that we cannot, at this moment, because of Thanksgiving or any other holidays we've done in the past. We can't let up now because the powers that have gotten us to this place of chaos never let up. So, yes, We will meet Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And if you're unable to be there, that's fine. That is fine. Are there any other questions about that? Thank you. You guys have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, too. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night.